From KCRW, this is Nocturne. So I had a, a spotter on the surface who showed me to the cave and said, okay, you're gonna enter this cave now and I'll see you in 24 hours. If I don't see you in 24 hours, I'm gonna come find you. And so I hoisted my backpack on my shoulder and headed into the darkness. And at this point I had my headlamp on and, and I found what looked like a comfortable place to camp, set everything up, laid out my sleeping bag sat with good posture and <laughs> crossed my legs and took a deep breath and, and turned out my light. Shortly after I cut my headlamp in this cave, I found myself sitting in complete, utter darkness. At first, it didn't really feel so different. It was something along the lines of waking up in an unfamiliar room in the middle of the night. And then what happened is that I blinked. And I could detect absolutely no evidence of the fact that I had blinked. I could feel that my eyelid had come down over my eye, that my eyelashes touched, but there was no evidence that this act had taken place. And that set my mind spinning. I was like, oh wow, this is different and this is gonna be intense. And over the course of the next so many hours, I slipped into this experience, this relationship with my body that I'd never really had before, where I could feel every twitch and I could feel even the tiniest functions in my body. I could feel my heart clenching and unclenching. I could feel my lungs filling up with air. And it was the sensation of being like turned inside out. It was the sense of being raw where every aspect of my sensory apparatus was on full alert. And I remember this moment where a drop of water fell from the ceiling and landed on my forehead. And I like leapt <laughs> out of where I was lying. It was just this kind of hair trigger sensitivity to the world. It was a little bit like being on drugs, <laughs> being like hopped up on amphetamines <laughs> where you feel everything so intensely, but at the same time, I was completely calm too. I had made camp in the cave not far from a little creek, which I had barely noticed when I first went in. It was just like a quiet little chuckle of water. But the longer I was in the dark zone and in complete darkness, the louder this creek became. It started to rise up in the cave in these like big effusive sounds and coiling against the walls of the cave. I just wanted to, to see how my body would react and how my mind would react and to really focus on it in a totally granular level and to spend 24 hours like thinking really carefully about every movement in my body, every rumble and twitch and to kind of meditate on my relationship with darkness. More from Nocturne in a moment. I'm Warren Alney. On To The Point, if America ever used its thousands of nuclear weapons, it would be suicidal. In a nuclear war, there could be no winners. Everybody is a loser. All of civilization is at stake. We've known that for 75 years, but our weapons of mass destruction are still on hair-trigger alert, and just one man, President Trump, has the power to push the button. Is it finally time to make the world safer? On our To The Point podcast. Listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe.
My name is Will Hunt. I'm a nonfiction writer, and I'm the author of Underground, A Human History of the Worlds Beneath Our Feet. The subterranean worlds explored in Underground have led Will across the globe, from the catacombs below Paris, mine shafts deep under the Great Plains in South Dakota, to Mayan caves hidden beneath forest in the Yucatan. But Will's eyes were first opened to the terrain underground in seemingly banal suburbia, which made the discovery that much more momentous. I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, and the summer I turned 16, I discovered an abandoned train tunnel that ran almost directly beneath my house. Will and a few friends went to explore this newly discovered space that had been under their feet their whole lives. The entrance to the cave was three blocks from his house. At the back of a a dentist's office parking lot. So it was this beautiful moment of parting a curtain of, of shrubs, of bush, and stepping through and finding ourselves staring into this giant train tunnel which was otherwise completely hidden from the surface. And it was at the bottom of this kind of gully full of mud and trash. And you could feel gusts of cool air coming out of the entrance. And we kind of looked at each other and we were like, okay, we're gonna do this. They climbed down through mud and muck over a concrete barrier and into the pitch black tunnel. And it was this big, echoing, spooky space. The tunnel was about a mile long. About halfway through, we all turned off our flashlights. The tunnel went to this like perfect ink darkness. And it was totally disorienting. You know, in day-to-day life, in the surface world, in normal reality, we don't experience complete darkness, not perfect darkness. And that was perfect darkness. You know, when you're holding up your hand in front of your face and you can't see anything. I was accessing this completely separate realm of sensation and experience. Will was bowled over, not just by the totally new sensory experiences, but by where this discovery was taking place. Directly beneath the most known, familiar place in my world, my house. It was a very particular feeling of astonishment. It just felt like this this sort of secret that I was just discovering about my home and my, my world at that time. It was then, at age 16, that Will got the first inkling of what the underground world would come to mean to him. Even then, I recognized that my reaction to the tunnel was a little bit different from my friends. They were kind of laughing and whooping in the dark. And I just remember (laughs) feeling this very intense mixture of terror and awe and astonishment. My whole body was prickling and bristling. I felt like I couldn't move. Like if I, if I moved, I might f- like float off the ground. And as a 16 year old, I was not particularly adventurous. I was an anxious kid. And for me to put myself in this kind of environment was out of the ordinary and it really threw me. It was this sensation of fear, but of, of excitement. I remember leaving the tunnel that day thinking like, wow, that was an entirely new experience and I can't wait to go check it out again. That's exactly what he did, often on his own and traversing deeper and deeper into the tunnel. And I spent a lot of time thinking about it and I just developed a a kind of fixation on it. It occupied a pretty large portion of my imagination for that summer. But the thing that really clinched it, the moment that transformed this from a summertime fascination into a lifelong calling and sometimes even obsession, happened soon after. One time I went down alone, and it was shortly after a a big rainstorm. And as I stepped across the threshold into the tunnel, 
I heard this echo, this this really deep kind of rumbling sound coming from the darkness ahead. And it was a sound that I had never heard before on previous trips. And I, at that moment, decided to not turn back and I just sort of kept going. And the deeper I went, the bigger and more expansive and more intense the sound became until I got to about halfway through the tunnel and realized that there was a cascade of water coming down from the ceiling. And on the floor, someone had arranged an entire assembly of buckets. Different kinds of containers, paint buckets and and beach pails and oil drums. And there were dozens of them all clustered on the ground. It was a drum system. It was a giant kind of improvised sound installation. So water was falling from the ceiling and hitting the top of these buckets and they're sending up this big echoing rumble. It was like like a kind of whale song. It's a sound I haven't encountered since. And meanwhile, I was in complete darkness, which only enhances the sound. And I just remember standing in the middle of the tunnel, looking at these buckets, looking up at the water falling down from the ceiling, feeling this echo kind of reverberate around me and just being bolted to the floor. Someone had really put the effort into creating something, something major. And what was so beautiful about it is that I knew that so few people knew about it and had seen it, and I had kind of stumbled upon this secret. When I think about it now, the, the artist or whoever it was who built this installation had me in mind. They were setting up a future encounter of some curious 16-year-old kid who steps into the dark and has this moment of communion with this kind of altar of buckets. While some kids gaze up at the stars and find themselves awed by the mysteries of the universe, Will was transfixed in the opposite direction. It was seeing traces of people who had gone down there before me and thinking there are these other people who know this secret space and now I'm one of them and that's really cool. But in a larger sense, it was like, oh, the world is so much bigger and more mysterious than I realized. Several years after that first discovery, Will connected with a community of urban explorers in New York City and encountered underground layers on a scale he'd never imagined. He began to form a picture in his mind of a world that's invisible to almost everyone else. Imagine the surface of the Earth just becoming transparent, like someone waves a magic wand and suddenly you can see through the street. So you find yourself looking straight down into this kind of wild cat's cradle of pipes and tunnels and catacombs and sewer lines and aqueducts and pneumatic tubes. It's like looking, looking into a body and seeing all the veins and arteries in the body. And then beneath that, wherever you are, you're going to come across caves or geological strata that contain, you know, fossils of extinct creatures. You're going to find archaeological remnants of cities that existed before. You're going to find ancient necropoli that contain graves with skeletons in them. And the crust of the earth is full of life. It's full of these tiny microbial creatures and we find them everywhere to the extent that we're beginning to believe that there may be more life underground than on the surface. So the underground is just like this teeming secret world that that people don't think about. 
Like a cross between an explorer and a peeping Tom, Will is compelled to discover what he's not meant to find. The thing I always thought about exploring underground was that I imagined kind of opening private drawers and reading like old letters in someone's house. And that's how you really learn about someone. And it's invasive and voyeuristic, but that's where the secrets are. And Will has been chasing these secrets for years all over the planet. New York City, Mexico, Belize, Paris, Poland, Berlin, all over Italy, the Ukraine, Turkey. In each of these places, India, Will dares himself to descend into an alien world, both frightening and irresistible. Part of the magic of the underground is this very primal relationship to darkness. On a biological level, we don't belong in the dark. Our eyes are not outfitted for darkness. Our ancestors, thousands of years ago, when the sun went down, that was when they were vulnerable. And when we go underground, we're going straight into darkness. You're submitting to the immensity and power and mystery of this force. Throughout history, people have been going into caves in every corner of the planet and subjecting themselves to the so-called dark zone of caves in order to commune with an alternate reality, to travel into an other world. We have evidence of shamans and mystics and seers and prophets going into caves to convene with spirits. Even the most trenchant atheist goes into the, the depths of a cave and kind of sits in the dark zone will recognize this as a, as a sacred space, as a, a holy space. One thing I've always noticed, and I think it's a manifestation of this, is that when people step into a cave, they involuntarily drop their voice to a whisper. And I feel like that's this little signal from some core space in our soul or mind which recognizes that this is a special place. One such place is deep in the Pyrenees Mountains in southern France, under land privately owned and available to explore only by rare invitation. Le Touc d'Odobert. It's owned by a, an old aristocratic family called the Beguin family. They don't let people go in there. It is one of the least accessible caves in the world. It's the most beautiful the most private, and also the most hidden. The secrets of La Touc d'Orobert were discovered by the father and uncles of Count Bergois in the early 1900s. The story goes that the brothers were poking around on the family estate and started following this river that flowed from within the cave. And over the course of a year, as they made successive explorations deeper into the cave, they made this unbelievable discovery. And... I started talking to archaeologists who told me, like, there's no way you're going to be able to, to enter that cave. Will wrote to the family anyway, fully expecting not to hear back. But then, out of nowhere, I got an email from Count Beguin saying, if you can be on my property on this day in November at this time, I will open the cave and give you a, a private tour. And so I, I did. I arrive at the Beguin estate, which is called Pujol, and it is the most beautiful place I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Just this big chateau bathed in golden light. And Count Beguin meets me outside. He is, you know, he's a count. <laughs> he's 76 years old and sort of very graceful. And there was a team of four archaeologists who were working there at the time, and they were totally baffled as to why he would invite me. So we all get suited up in coveralls and, and helmets and boots and head down to the mouth of the cave, which is just down the hill from the house, through the woods a little bit. We climb down into this ravine where there's a, a little bathtub-sized boat sitting on the side of the river, the River Vulp, which is the river that runs through the cave. Two by two, we, we board the boat and wobble and row upriver into the cave. And there's this very intense moment that you have 
anytime you enter a cave, I always feel it very viscerally when you're crossing from light into dark and you, you pass through what cave scientists call the twilight zone and into the dark zone. So we emerge into the first chamber of the cave, which is this, this very large chamber festooned with stalactites. And the Count turns to us and says, from here on, you have to be so careful. This is a pristine cave. Usually when you excavate a cave as an archeologist, you're, you're taking everything out of it. You're, you're digging up the ground. And because this is a special kind of archaeological cave, the family has elected to, to leave everything in situ. So he explains that we have to follow a very distinct path and essentially follow in the footsteps of the last people to enter this cave 14,000 years ago. It's this culture known as the Magdalenians and they are the people who made the paintings in Lascaux and are, are kind of the great artists of prehistory in, in Western Europe. So do not bump into any walls, just be careful. They begin their trek into the body of the cave, ducking beneath curtains of stalactites and climbing up a high ladder to a cliff in order to access the passage deeper into the cave. The Magdalenians would have had to scale the cliff or find some other way up. I should also say that over the entire course of this journey, we're periodically stopping to look at traces of prehistoric people moving through this cave. And you can see perfect footprints. You can see like strange things that they've left on the sides of the path. At one point we came across a bear skull. So we've been in the cave now for say two and a half hours and no one's really speaking. We're all kind of floating. We are climbing and crawling and, and, and ducking through the various passageways of this cave until we get to what's called the Chatier, um, which means the catway. And it is an intensely constrictive passage. The Chatier was so narrow that the Count had actually asked Will an important question before he invited him to the cave. Are you skinny? And I said, I am. And he said, that's good because there's a part of the cave where a lot of people have had to turn back. And this is that moment. The count goes first. He immediately gets down on his belly and starts crawling through and we see his feet disappear. I went last and I suspect I'm probably less claustrophobic than most people. I had been through a lot of caves and had crawled through all kinds of tight spaces. This one was intense for a couple reasons. It was extremely tight. There were stalactites coming down from the ceiling and you can't touch those because the cave is such a special place. It's so pristine. One of the things that the Count told us as we were about to enter the Chatier is if you panic, do not get up. There's also little traces of artwork along parts of the Chatier. You can't brush up against that. So I start crawling through on my elbows. I'm completely flat. It's the sensation of being like entombed. Oftentimes in caves or other subterranean environments, you'll have to make a very quick crawl through a narrow space, but you know, it's only say, two or three feet long, so you're never completely enclosed. This was much longer, so for several minutes, you're crawling and you're aware of this mass of rock over your head. This is a moment where if you were susceptible to, to claustrophobia, you would be freaking out. It's completely dark. You take the headlamp off of your helmet and you're holding it in your teeth just to make sure your head can fit through the passage. People in the past who have visited this cave have described the sensation of being like trapped in a coffin at this point. I was very anxious. I was, I was anxious in anticipation and watching people's feet disappear one by one. I'm thinking, I wonder if this is gonna be the moment where I freak out. Like maybe this will be the trip into the cave where 
you know, something snaps in my brain and it goes wrong. This did not turn out to be that time. Will made it through the Chatier and emerged into a chamber full of glass-like stalactites so fine, it looked as though a winter ice storm had blown through. The stalactites are so delicate, they're known by cavers as soda straws. And as the story goes, when the Beguin brothers first entered this chamber, which no one had stepped foot in for 14,000 years, just the sound of their voices was enough to break these tiny soda straw stalactites and cause them to shatter. Now, through the Chatier, we continue this duck walk movement through another chamber and another. And then at some point, the Count tells everyone to just stop where you are and to kneel. And he says to turn out your lights. And for several moments, we're all kneeling in complete darkness. And he suddenly turns on his light. And he says, now I would like to ask you to slowly turn around. And we all do, we find ourselves in this this small sort of dome-shaped chamber. At the center of the chamber, there's a stone, a large stone. Leaning up against that stone, illuminated in the Count's headlamp, are two sculptures of bison. In the moment that the bison are revealed, there's this collective intake of breath and just this long exhale. And in that moment, I felt this tension that had been building in me for the entire trip through this cave, just like come unbound. And I started sobbing in the dark. So the count is like whispering now and he says, we can slowly approach the bison. There are clay sculptures of bison. They are just the most beautiful piece of artwork I'm sure I will ever see in my life. They're about two feet long. There's a male and a female, and they are around 14,000 years old. They're so perfectly preserved, you can still see traces of the fingers of the people who sculpted them. Just the, the level of detail was dumbfounding. It was the perfect swoop of their back the hunch of the shoulders, the texture of the beard was perfect, the horns in the male. It was just such a, such an intense encounter. And I think part of it was being underground. Your emotions are always heightened. But the mystery of that reaction is that we know nothing about what those bison meant to the people who made them. 14,000 years later, like, we just have the sketchiest contours of how they lived in the world. And we don't know anything about their, their gods or their myths or any kind of cultural context for these sculptures. But it was, you could just sort of feel time fall away. Like, having undergone this, this journey through the cave... It was so clear that whoever made those bison 14,000 years ago would have undergone such great effort to get to that place and to, to slowly, painstakingly create these things that whatever would have compelled them to do that must have been so intense. It could only have been so intense. You could feel it. You could feel the energy and the urgency in that space, it was like the bison were kind of radiating with it. It boggles the mind how dangerous it would have been for Magdalenian people to make that same journey that we had with our headlamps and battery packs and boots. The kind of emotional stakes of making those sculptures in the deepest possible chamber, as far from sunlight as they could possibly go, are so great and so universally recognizable. I don't think I've ever felt so human 
you know, you're like staring into something you should not understand. And yet in your core, you understand it perfectly. It was made to be hidden and made to be very difficult to see. And in so doing, whoever made that sculpture knew that anyone who did see it would be really deeply impacted by it. I think that the Magdalenians created those bison where they did to cultivate a, a feeling of transcendence in whoever saw them. I think they were hidden in order to be seen by people who earned the viewing. This sense of earning the discovery, of finding a treasure in the dark left seemingly just for you, that began for Will when he was 16 and stumbled across the sound installation made from buckets underneath his neighborhood. That was his teenage version of a set of 14,000-year-old bison sculptures. But in both cases, it wasn't just the treasure that Will found so compelling. It was his connection to the people who left it. It was a very similar sensation of just this cosmic intimacy. It's something quintessentially human. I mean, in the depths of the Tuk Dodo Bear, I felt like I was crouching in that chamber next to the people who made that sculpture. We haven't changed. We still are sensitive to the same drama, the same sensations that, that they would have experienced so long ago. All over the world for hundreds of thousands of years, people thought of caves as actual physical portals into a spirit world or an other world. And while we don't think that way today in, in the modern West, when we do go underground, we're following in the exact same footsteps as people who did believe those things. In Le Touc de Robert, for example, there's only so many ways you can move your body to get to that last chamber. So, so we're literally performing this kind of like shadow dance of following the precise footsteps of, of anyone who ever entered that cave. And our bodies are undergoing the same sensory experience, our brains are reacting in the same way, and we're interpreting those experiences in a different way. But it's the same feeling of stepping inside of an alternate reality and of entering this heightened, intense space. And it's the feeling of time falling away. It's the feeling of communion with humanity, like this like sense of oneness. In an age where it can feel like little is left unexplained, following footsteps into the dark underground can lead us to more than artifacts. In the post-enlightenment modern West, our culture is sort of engineered towards wanting to cast light on every hidden place, wanting to sort of solve every mystery. And for me, the underground is a reminder that there's something beautiful and seductive about the things that are not revealed. I think it's humbling and it allows us to be sort of vulnerable. This admission that not all of this is going to be solved, that there's always going to be a gap between what we want to know and what we know. I think it helps us connect with some sort of soul. It helps us situate ourselves in the world and it keeps us humble. And I think just being aware of hiddenness, of being aware of all these spaces that we can't see beneath our feet, it reminds us how big and beautiful and mysterious the world is. And I just think it reminds us who we are as humans and how we really fit into the larger world. You've been listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. The show is produced by me and was created by myself and Kent Sparling, who also composed the theme music. Nocturne is distributed by KCRW. Our senior editor there is Nick White. Nocturne also receives support from KCRW's independent producer project. 
You can find information about Will Hunt and his adventures in the underground at our website, nocturnepodcast.org, in the show notes for this episode. Till next time, thanks for listening.